slightly late, we'll get right to our program. It's really an honor to introduce Rick Gaffigan, who is a two-time 2023 Monmouth County History Award winner. Uh, he's the author of many books, including Stories of Slavery, in the History of Monmouth County, uh, and he'll tell you about all the others. Uh, without further ado, please welcome Rick Gaffigan. I'm going to try to move around so you all can hear me and I'm going to ask you to keep me embarrassed with questions. <laughs> so, here I am. Uh, let me get into my little speaker in the back. So, we can see. so what we're going to call that. Thank you again. Um, yeah. I'm standing before you today, a uh, well meaning elderly man with a strong <laughs> Uh, in fact, I don't even remember being here to order. <laughs> um, but I, but I do know a lot about this town because I grew up at the other end of it, up in Gravelly Point. Um, when I was a kid, my uh, parents would rent a bungalow every year. We came to Forest forever and ever before. I think before Jay was even here, but regardless of that. Um, I didn't realize a lot then that I do now about this town, and in preparation for this story we're going to talk about, uh, I found out a whole lot more, which I hope will be good thing to you as well. So um, I had to rely on a lot of sources uh, to come up with some of this information. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Is this, is okay. No, uh, is, is, this, is this projecting Michael out to them too? Do we have a yes. sound? Okay. Yes. They say they can hear, so. Okay. Even though sleeping in the back. Okay. And so we're going to talk about what did happen here 247 years ago. And actually, it happened right where we are. Okay. Because people walk right where we're uh, sitting now um, uh, that were involved with this famous incident. So we're going to talk about that if my uh, my little deal here works. Occasionally it does. Right. It's and then, of course, not. Okay, well, so we'll do it the old fashioned way. Just make sure you share the screen right now. Nobody can see the screen. Uh, all right, another delay. I don't know why that is, Michael. I'm just going to share. All right, we're doing this by Zoom Live, which is part of our, our issue here. Because we got about 50 people out there in the, in the, in the cloud, plus about 50 something. All right, there. so share screen. I can't see without my glasses. <laughs> <laughs> He's another well meaning elderly man. <laughs> right, Michael? Yes, indeed. Okay. Share screen. Can you find it? Yes, stay on the bottom there. Share screen. Look at that. Pick your present presentation. Share. Okay. So let me get rid of this in the corner. And so it should be good now. But I want All right. To so. You'll yell at me if the Zoom people aren't there. Okay, and now, of course, this doesn't work, but we'll get there. This meeting is being recorded. It says it right there, Michael. Okay, except my slides are not advancing because we've got too many things going on. Like a Swiss watch. Uh, Michael, we're getting some interference here, or I can't do a slide. Oh. Ah, there you go. Ah. You can all read that, yeah? <laughs> so, where I got started with this several years ago, I found this article written by uh, an MC, Murray Hyde, um, and she didn't put this little other thing in there, so we'll get rid of that. It's an article in the New York Times in uh, 1896, says here, and it's about, it says, this battle that happened in Navasig that I had never heard of. Uh, how many had heard of this growing up or, you know, whenever whenever we were in school? A couple of folks, right? Probably local folks. And so what I did was I went into a little bit of research. Uh, and in fact, sometimes this even worked. Hang on. Michael, we're still getting interference with this somehow. It's not allowing me to advance. Use, use your space bar. 
Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> yeah, all of the usual controls. Are, oh, okay. It's a delay, so I'll speak even slower. So M.C. Murray Hyde wrote an article in the New York Times, and then a few months later, another article with a slightly different take on what had happened appears in the American Monthly, which is a kind of a history um, publication back then. Same author, uh, and as you noticed here, maybe, this, uh, this uh, image that was used in the New York Times, I actually found that in M.C. Murray Hyde's archives, which are now in the New York Public Library. I went up there trying to find out if I could get the original notes to what went on here, because I had some concerns about what was portrayed. Um, and the first thing I noticed, and it's a nit, but nonetheless, here, the article is talking about Hart Thorne's Cove at Long Point. Okay, and I knew that was wrong, because first of all, Long Point's across the river in Rumson, okay? And so there's a little bit of a, a mistranslation here. And by the way, everybody knows that, maybe you don't, but when I was growing up, we called it Hartshorns, uh, Hartshorns, but it's really Hartshorn. It's an English family, and a heart is a deer. So it's Hartshorn, right? They're from, uh, I went last year to England, and I went to the town where Richard Hartshorn came from, a little town called Hathorn, lovely little place. But anyway, uh, that's their family story. But anyway, this image, the original image, which I believe that was copied from, is showing the view from what is now Rumson, of course, across the river to uh, to where we are. And let's see. Hello, oh, there's my family. Aren't they lovely? <laughs> <laughs> we just have, I'm sorry, we have too much going on here tonight, Michael. All right. We'll get there. Oh, you didn't want to see that, did you? No. Okay. Let's see if we're back. So there's an image. Here's Hart's Orange Cold here. This is where we are actually we're down here. And that's Long Point, which is part of the Rumson Fairhaven Peninsula. Okay. So right away, I had some questions about the, the uh, authority here. And so who was M.C. Mary Hyde? Surprise. Okay, it was Mary Crawford Mary Hyde, uh, who was a woman who had done a lot of research into her family, some of whom were at this battle that we're going to talk about. With any luck at all, we can show things that work. Good. One of the people here was her great, great, uh, she's the great, great granddaughter of a man named James Cooper, who was captured during this incident. He was actually captured out on the... Uh, on the beach out there as part of this. We'll talk about that. And she also, and this you'll like if it ever shows up, uh, she also, you'll notice the name Crawford, which is a famous family name in Mama County, goes back a long, long time. She was also the uh, granddaughter of, uh, a great-granddaughter of a man named, I promise I have him here somewhere, um, Murray. Uh, is Randy here tonight? Okay, my friend Randy here was like it. But anyway, um, you know the Murray farmhouse in Forestry Park? Mm -hmm. Okay, so her great grandfather was Murray, who was murdered in mm -hmm. farm in Middletown uh, by some Tories during the war, a couple of years after the war. We're going to talk about it. So, my whole point of that is that she had a lot of credibility since it was her family that she had written about for years. Ah. Joseph Murray, who was murdered by loyalists, I say. And right there is an image of the farmhouse, which uh, no longer exists. But that is the original house where he lived. He was part of the militia at one point. You might know it that way as Porsche Park, where the Middletown uh, Historical Society has, has some of his meetings. So the point is that uh, she had a lot of credibility until I started looking a little bit more into what she had written. And like all of us, most including me, you know, we can't get everything 100% right when we're doing historical research. Unless you have the primary document, you know, things get uh, mistranslated and stories get repeated, and we sometimes are not exactly perfect. So let's talk a little bit about what happened, and then I'll show you where some of the mystery and the explanation comes in. So here's a sketch that accompanied the article in the New York Times, and it's familiar to everybody that lives around here. Um, and the backstory is that uh, a guy named Nathaniel Scudder, 
was in charge of the Monmouth militia. And right there, if you can see it right there, there was a shipwreck. Uh, it was actually a French vessel that the British had captured, and they forced the captain to bring all his supplies to Sandy Hook where they were. That was the prelude to this whole thing. So when the Monmouth, Monmouth militia finds out about this, uh, they uh, launch some people from Black Point. You know Black Point in Romson? Okay, I hope. Um, to go see if they could capture this, uh, this ship that had grounded on the Barrier Beach right there at number one. And part of the troop of uh, British um, soldiers that came down from Staten Island were what were called New Lennox. These were people that just drafted based in Tory, as well as the regular army. So they split up when they get down here. The new levies go to uh, that uh, shipwreck point, um, and the 26th Regiment of Foot, the British uh, Redcoats, frankly, according to uh, Mary here, attack Richard Hartford's house. And that's where the little controversy starts to happen. And that was, if you can see the two there, in Hartford's quote, she says. Okay, and during this, battle, okay, uh, the militia gets four, uh, 25 people killed, 40 uh, militiamen escape, a lot of them are wounded, they die in the woods right over where we're sitting here, um, 72 get taken as prisoners of war, and the British lose one person. So the question is, is this a battle or a skirmish? Okay, so my friend Randy Gabriel said, what kind of a battle is this? You know, it's totally one-sided, which is true. Um, and we'll get to it in a few minutes to miss the why it's not publicized. Okay, so I took my little kayak this summer, walked there across there under the bridge, and went around to find out what I could. And there is a uh, composite picture of me, and not me, but the scene in um, Hartshorn's Cove. And the first problem I noticed is that if you're at Richard Hartshorn's house, the original Richard Hartshorn's house, which goes through a couple of generations, you're not going to be able to see the shipwreck on the beach at his, what is now Seabright Monmouth Beach. Right? Your line of sight's just, just not there. And furthermore, that's an image I stole from that first image we had. Where the Hearts Orange House originally was is not where Portland is now. It was on the other side, which would be the east side of the uh, cove which would make it even more impossible for a militia from there to see the shipwreck. And that's what she's writing about, that Scudder's militia spots the shipwreck and they're going to go over and, and loot it. So I started to look, um, without Colette, okay, at a whole bunch of maps, some of which are not historical, some of which are, just to give you a sense of, of what's going on. Here's Hartshorn's Cove right there. We're over here right now. There's about where the shipwreck was. So if you're here, you don't have a line of sight to see this. So something didn't ring true for me. Um, and then I looked a little bit further at the other geography that she was talking about. Aha, uh -huh. okay. So a guy named Richard, or I should say, sorry, Roger Morris was a captain who were con was controlling these Tory new levies so far. When the British split up, his group came down here. And what um, Crawford Hyde, Murray Hyde writes is that he was related to the famous Morris family from the Passage Point Morrises, a guy named Lewis Morris. Um, and unfortunately, she was wrong. And she writes in here that, therefore, he knew this area. But it turns out that this particular guy was actually the Morris family from Yorkshire, England, which is a whole different family because the Lewis Morris and the rest of those Morrises are from Wales. Okay, and that's not a major mistake. I mean, it's an easy enough thing to assume, um, but it made me question a lot of other things. So she also says that the militia assembled the quartermaster Richard Hartshorn's house. And that was there, that little house that I showed you on the far eastern side of the cove. And again, I know that there's no line of sight that they could see that. And it wouldn't be a very good place to uh, assemble a militia permanently because you're, you're in jeopardy there for a couple of reasons we'll get into. So she also says that Major Andrew Gordon, who's leading these, uh, the regiment of foot, 
They enter the mouth of the Navasink River and land near Island Beach. And she's writing in 1896 at what she says, the location of where the twin beacons are there at that point, the twin light she's talking about. They obviously weren't here in 1777. So that led me to think, well, how does that happen? There was an inlet here, okay? And so if they came down from Staten Island and they came from here and then go up there, why are they doing that to go away from Hartshorn's house? Of course, they don't want to be observed. Um, but then she also says that they landed Island Beach, which you could see the remnants of if you look out the window here. Okay. The twin beacons she's talking about, again, 1896 or the 1864 twin lights that we know now. They weren't there during the time. And then she kind of hedges her bet in one of her two articles. She says, oh, and the British land, and they go about a mile further to the house of one Hartshorn. So she doesn't say Richard Hartshorn this time. And that led me to think, wait a minute, something's going on here. And what I think was going on was this. Richard Hartshorn lived there, the quartermaster of the militia. Uh, his uncle, Isaac, or Asif, Hartshorn lived on the other side of where we are, the other side of town, basically. Okay. Then she also says the British landed about two miles below the rebel post, wading up to their waist on the beach at Highlands, and then about one mile west near Richard Hartshorn's house. So, you know, which is it? It's, it's hard to understand. If they're landing here, that's not one mile from there, and the beach, and, and it's a confused scenario. And she's going on the best information she had, obviously. She also says that there was a guard posted at this militia outpost at the Hartshorn house, and they heard the British coming, and they got alarmed and panicked and ran away before anything could happen. And then the rest of the militia starts to flee before the British catch them and inflict all these wounds and killings. So the story's a little muddled uh, based on what she knew. And one of my jobs when I went to the uh, public library in New York was to hope I could find her notes and maybe reinterpret them. Um, but I didn't find enough there to, uh, to, co to uh, contradict anything she had said. And again, with all due respect, she had relatives in this part of the world and in this battle and knew a lot about her family. So the other scenario I said, well, wait a minute, what if the British came down here and then came along here and then in there? And a couple of problems with that is, you know, how are they going to surprise anybody? If the militia's up here at this house, on our side, if you will, of the Highlands, they're going to see the ship. How is she going to get there? And what has that got to do with Island Beach anyway? So the whole thing didn't quite make sense to me as I, as I looked at this. So I started to look at the possible British roots. And the biggest hint I got was that General William Howe says in one of his reports, a considerable number of the number of the rebels, meaning the militia, had appeared on the heights above the Sandy Hook Lighthouse. So recall in those days that the British controlled Sandy Hook because it was the entryway to New York and still it. And so it's not, and it was in the lighthouse, which was built in what, 17, somebody helped 46. Okay. If they're if they're on the heights, they're here. They're not on the cove on the other side. And that makes perfect sense. If you've ever been up the top of Scenic Drive or any place like that, or even on um, up on uh, what is now Route 36, Navasink Avenue, you have this commanding view of British shipping coming into the harbor, going up and back and forth to New York. So that made more sense to me that any militia outpost would be here as opposed to the other side of the, uh, of the cove. All right, so I sort of discounted that route that they would come, and that leaves this route. And it turns out that there was an opening here. We'll talk about how many openings there were from the ocean into the Navasink River directly, which comports exactly with what she says. Now, you do know, I hope, that Monotani, uh, during the during the war, was engaged in a civil war. Okay, you had families fighting families and you know, all kinds of messes. There were people that pretended to be neutral during this war in their own best interest. You had people on both sides, no matter where their uh, loyalties were, to the British or to the colonists, um, supplying um, whatever they could to make money. Okay. And so one of the guys here, a guy named McLeese, you know, McLeese Creek right up here, okay, was allegedly on the side of what we call now the Patriots. 
And he actually betrays him. He goes to Sandy Hook and says, hey, uh, there's a bunch of militia stationed over here. I can help you through the shoals and the, the narrow parts of the river. And he's talking about this entryway to the Navasi, which he knew very well. So again, from my kayak last summer, I was out on one of those shoal islands there looking at what is Rocky Point right down here, right half a mile or so. And it made sense to me that that would be the place that the British would land, depending upon what they were trying to do. They didn't want to be seen where East at Hartshorn and the militia was, which I would begin to believe. Um, and if they went in through the Navasink River up through to Hartshorn, they'd be seen pretty quickly too. Okay, so I started to unravel this. And this is going to be hard to see, but this is a survey of what we all now think of as Hartshorn's Woods, right? This whole peninsula here, saying it was up here. And what had happened was that when Richard Hartshorn, the progenitor's son, William, died. His sons, Isaac and Robert, split the property. And you can roughly see these lines, right? They each get about 765 acres of land. They jointly have Sandy Hook and keep it during the war. So right here, again, Hartshorn's Cove, why don't you do that, is where Robert Hartshorn, the grandson of Richard, has his house. And the militiaman Richard's his son, right? The the uh, quartermaster. Okay. So when I started to look at that, things things to begin uh, began to change for. Me. So um, as I said, I went to England last year, found out a whole lot of things about Richard Hartshorn, uh, who was uh, well connected, uh, one of the early founding uh, fathers, if you will, of Monmouth County, and he owned all this land and a lot of other stuff too. And then as luck would have it, we happen to have, and I'll have to give Michael credit, we have these charts from the English, because the English were the best navigators of the time, and Rick Van Henry, I hear quite say that. <laughs> and what they did was, aside from charts and all that, they produced these, what they call headland views. And it turns out that I found the ones that were done the same year as this battle, 1777. And you can see here, this is looking from, you know, north, maybe Atlantic Island, if you will. There's the lighthouse. Here's Sandy Hook. There's a, probably a British ship there. Here are the highlands. And when I looked at that closely, you'll have to trust me on this, under some magnification, and that's why they use these charts, to give people real visuals about where they're going. I saw something here that looks a lot like a house on this side where we are, this side of Hartshorn's uh, woods. And I thought it has to be Isaac Hartshorn's house mm -hmm. because that's got the commanding view of the harbor all the way up through then Sandy Hook uh, and still, of course, and into New York. Another map, and this one shows you that depending upon the year, there were inlets all the time breaking through the barrier beach out here to um, the Navasink and the Shrewsbury Rivers, right? So another map you see, this was called the gut, but this didn't open until 1778 during a winter storm. And anybody that's lived here any amount of time knows what happens to our beachfront during a winter storm. Well, think about it when it was unprotected, it was happening a lot back then. As a matter of fact, I found at the Monmouth County Storm Association in the Hartthorn files, a couple of notes. In the bottom note, which you can't read, says this. This 20th day of December, 1756, with a very violent storm of wind at Sandy Hook, the beach broke through right near Harriman's Cove. And it's signed by Robert Hartzell. So the Hartzells, because they own this property, were very involved in it and wanted to know everything about this. So this went on frequently through our early history, where this storm would come, open up an inlet, it would close up again, depending upon the time of year. And so I had to examine that to figure out exactly where the British were going to be able to come through during that time. So then I got into stuff that bores most people, but I love to do. I decided to do a deed trace all the way back. And I'm lying here because the first one I say I have is 1670, when the East Jersey proprietors, English people, sell Richard Hartshorn a huge piece of land. And the reason I'm lying is, Claire, there were people here before, okay, well, not a Muncie, 
who they kindly were defrauded out of this land, okay? But that's not the way Europeans saw it in those days. So I started with this, and then I worked my way down all the way to 1870 to all the deeds at the Monmouth County Ar uh, Archives and found out a bunch of interesting things, including some very, very interesting names that, for instance, part of that property in 1836 was owned by Abraham and Mary Springsteen. Oh. <laughs> but before we jump to conclusions, there were a lot of Springsteen, this Dutch form. Spring stone, right? Yeah. Okay. So there were a lot of spring scenes because they were Dutch. And a lot of these names are Dutch or English, but predominantly they're heart thorns until the certain year that we're going to talk about. So this is a coastal survey map. Uh, early in the 19th century, we start to do coastal surveys. And I know it's very hard to see, but here's Sandy Hook up here, there's Spurman City Cove. And when I looked at this map from 1836, you know, a good 50 years after the battle. Right there, on this side of the of uh, Mount Mitchell, they had designated a house, East Chimney, which was really, really interesting to me because we know that when uh, Asa Cartsorn put up his house in 1762, it had a very prominent East Chimney. And it all made sense. Of course, that would be used as a point of navigation it was the only thing that high on this side of the hills in the highlands. And it persisted for years and years that people used that as a marker, as a you know, ship coming across, hitting roughly Sandy Hook, and then going north into New York. So that was a, a pretty good waypoint. Um, and I hope you can see this. But down here on that same map, it said Highlands Lighthouse, Navison Lighthouse. And that referred to one of the owners of the property eventually, a guy named Nimrod, believe it or not, Woodward who sold the three acres that becomes the original, and these are the original dual lights. It's not the sandy, it's not the twin lights that you see now. These were built in 1828. So that sort of replaced the marker of the, uh, the landmark that people were using to, to navigate in. Okay, another map a couple years later shows me something else. There is where E6 Hartshorn ha house is, and you can see what is then now the St. Gavin, but it's now Route 36. Okay, so that tells me he's on the, you know, kind of northeast side of the highway. Um, and it also told me a couple of other things. If you look here, I don't know if you know this, but what happened here in Highlands from Bay Avenue East was really a landfill project in the early 20th century. All of this would have been underwater. Okay, and that's depicted pretty, pretty abruptly here. So it's marshy, sandy land, probably covered at high tide, um, which is why Bay Avenue, thank you very much, still floods today. Okay. But I knew where that house was, um, and I knew what happened. In 1795, Isaac Hartzorn dies. Okay. A couple of years later, his daughter, Elizabeth, buys out her brothers from all of this property, Sandy Hook and all of Hartzorn's woods. She marries a guy named Tylee Williams, and he pays, they pay, uh, 8,000 pounds for all this property. Um, in 1809, Nimrod Wilson buys it from them for $7,800. So as I'm tracing these deeds, I'm looking at this huge portion of land, and it's becoming, you know, smaller and smaller as it, as it divvies up. Um, and this is where things start to get really interesting for me. He opens up what he calls the Woodward Hotel. And he also has what he calls Woodward's Landing. So if you go about a half a mile down Bay Avenue, what became known uh, as Shoal Harbor, you know that little inlet there? That was actually a creek uh, in real time. Um, and Nimrod Woodward was going to attract people from New York to come down to his hotel. So he built a landing there. Now, this is a different landing on the other side of the, of the hills, but it would have looked something like this. Just a real basic landing at his creek so people could literally walk up the hill a little bit to his fabulous hotel in 1809. Because Highlands has now started to change as a destination, although you know, carefully and over a long time, as a summer resort. Fast forward 1846. This guy, Colonel William Jones, buys the property, including the hotel from Nimrod. Woodward, um, 
And there's Woodward's Landing here. Here's where we are, right over here. And this guy's a pretty famous guy. He's a military man for his entire career. He becomes the sheriff of New York County and New York City. He runs the infamous Coons. So the guy's got a lot of money. And he decides for some reason to come down here, buy this property, and improve it. He does that. He takes the basic house that Issa Parkshorn built, and that was expanded by Woodward, and Jones makes it into what he calls now the Navasing Hotel. And he's using that dock to bring people to his resort and to enjoy themselves down here for the summer. And then as time marches on, you can see that it's still there over these various maps that I found. There's uh, Island Beach, so-called. The inlet is now closed. Uh, and there it says, William Jones, Navasink Hotel. And notice over here on Hartshorn's Cove, Miss Hartshorn and Portland Place are still there, but a later iteration of the original home. Yet another map. And this is the one that cinched the deal for me, and I hope for you too. That says William Jones. But if you look here, you see that off of Navasink, which is now Route 36, there's this little extended road that makes an L turn. And you and I know that very, very well. Okay. And here's a later image, but that is actually, and I checked it a couple of ways, which I'll show you about, the corner of Linden Avenue and Waterwich. Okay. So when I knew that, when I saw this right there in Williams Jones Hotel there, I knew that I had something I was searching for. And I verified that location because the oldest house in Highland is still up there by OLPH is, uh, was owned by James McGarry, right? Still there. The, and right where his house is, OLPH was even there then, is right up the block from where this was. So now I knew where Isaac Carthorne's house was. And oh, by the way, in those days, the early part of the 19th century, that lower part of Highlands was called Witch Hollow. Let's strike a bell. Because later on, this becomes Linden Avenue and Water Witch Drive. And I think you know where that happened. And if you don't, you will now. It happened because of this guy. Okay, James Fenimore Cooper. Okay, born in Burlington, New Jersey, but he didn't spend a lot of time there. And he becomes associated over time with this legend that we're going to talk about. Okay, because he writes this very famous book called The Water Witch or Skimmer of the Sea. Now, it turned out he went into the Navy, but there's no evidence that he was ever here or knew anything about this. But this is the famous part of that book where it is quoted, I won't read you the whole thing, but there it is, Lust in Rust. Okay, and he's talking about this fabulous rest area in the hills. And before you get excited by the title, it's just Dutch for pleasure in rest. <laughs> but it takes on a life of its own for a couple of reasons. First of all, James Fennell Cooper did live in Highlands, but not this one. He lived in the Highlands way up in uh, Otsego, New York, next to Cooperstown, which is named after his father, where the baseball hall of fame is in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what I'm pretty sure happened was, and this book is out for a while now, as time goes on, people go, hey, there's a nice tie-in. We've got a witch hollow. He's talking about water witch. And so the name kind of migrates, uh, and the legend says that, oh, yeah, he was here, and he knew all about the stuff. And if anybody knows that to be a fact, I'd really like to talk to you. I can't find that he was ever here. Maybe. Okay. So that leaves the question, did he use Woodward's Hotel as a model when it was here? And then, of course, later Jones Hotel. Again, no proof that he was ever here, um, but the stories emerge over time. And then Highlands, in its wisdom, and smartly enough, takes some of the names in that book to name streets after scenes in the book. Okay, Barbary, Cedar, Water, which you already know about, right? Okay, I think that happened, I know it happened later in time. So they're just capitalizing on the fact that a very popular American writer seems to be talking about this locale. Okay, this is where it really happened. 1870, I find this map. And what this map is, is basically a development map. And a guy named Gilbert Giles, actually. 
He's buying up all kinds of property on the other end of town, okay? Um, and here, so you know, that's Linden Avenue. Here's Waterwich before they're even named that. Here's Navasink Avenue, Route 36. And on this map is a house that says boarding house. That's the hotel, part of which property he buys in, uh, and starts to develop. And this whole area down here, and you can even see it, now being landfilled, okay, uh, well into the 20th century, so that there's more property there for summer vacation or like me and my family years and years later. And even this creek is still named in this map, Jones Creek, okay? And that's important because I'm pretty sure that in an incident that we'll talk about later, Jones Creek is where another group of British folks landed in a very famous incident at the other end of town for another night where a guy was allegedly hanged from a barrel, okay, that set off an international uh, incident. Now, when I was a child, a kid, when my parents rented a bungalow in Bradley Point, down on the other end of this road, uh, I would go through on my little bike, Honey Park, and I would see the monument. And then later on, I would walk up through what then became uh, Linden Avenue, or I should say Waterwich Avenue, and they would cut off on the way to church at OLPH, never having a clue that any of this stuff had happened, just because people had just forgotten it and stopped talking about it. And right there was where Bradley Point Road on the end of this uh, at Bay Avenue is where I grew up. And here I am in my sartorial splendor. <laughs> <laughs> it says here August of 57. So I'm all grown up years old. And, uh, but I'm a proud fisherman, dressed to the nines as always. Um, and so from that place where we rented bungalows, I would always come up along what we all call Shore Avenue, but that was a railroad tracks. Mm -hmm. There was a Waterwich railroad station and there was another one right here uh, at the other end of Highlands. And again, I had no idea that I was walking by, you know, Mr. where Joshua Huddy was hanging uh, in 1782, nor any of this other stuff. Because I would cut through, there's a road there now, on the way up to OLPA on Sundays. No clue that this was happening. But it all starts to come together when I realize that this incredible history. And where the legend starts to kick in is around 1875, when that hotel uh, that had so many different names finally burns down. Okay, it's 100 and, you know, 15 or 20 years old at that point. It's a built, the original building. And in uh, Harper's uh, magazine, they start to do a story and they show the ruins of, they say, Lust in Rust, this fabulous hotel that people wrote about. A um, couple of years go by, and in 1915, there were two erect chimneys at that point, and uh, a local doctor takes them, one of them down, and incorporates them into his own fireplace in his house here in the Highlands. So I'm pretty sure the following happened. And both, by the way, a friend of mine, Wolf Gulf, the gun person, the Highland Service Body, still has the end irons and some of those fixtures for their fireplace, which may date back to the meeting of Hartford House for all weeks. But this fireplace, and I don't know how faithfully he reconstructed it, was probably that chimney, the famous old East chimney. And then over years, what was here was a three floor chimney uh, and fireplace on the other side. And the legend of Cooper and Lust and Rust gets pretty well solidified into Highlands history at this point. Um, and again, unless somebody can show me, I can't find any news that James Flower Cooper was either here or knew about it. So it may be a coincidence, uh, but it got a lot of traction. And it also helped Highlands, because Highlands is now, by the early 20th century, becoming a mecca of New Yorkers and North people, uh, people from North Jersey come down and make their summers. And all kinds of wonderful things have happened. You know about San Luis Beach across, across which is a fabulous uh, amusement park and all these other things that happen here. So let's get back to the battle for a second to show you what happened and then I'll show you how I came to this conclusion. So up here in Staten Island, of course, the British control all of that during the war and the revolution, a uh, place called Corlett's Ferry 
they leave in this ship called the Siren, um, smaller ship, 28 guns, and they've got two groups of people on board. They've got the 26th Regiment of Foot and these so-called new levies uh, in, um, on board. As you remember, the new letters are going to go here and secure the shipwreck back from the militia, which they do. And in the uh, uh, regiment of foot, they're going to attack the militia up here in the hill. So we know a little bit about Major Andrew Gordon. Uh, and in one of the great ironies of history, after this war is over and he goes back to England, he becomes the governor of the Isle of Salisi, <laughs> the English Channel, where he stops. So you, know, you can't make some of this stuff. Uh, we don't have his image, but we do have this guy. This is the Roger Mark, who was part of the Levies, the people that were drafted to, uh, to fight against the colonialists. And that's his image. Uh, and he's the guy that secured this shipwreck, by the way. The militia had freed the British captain from port and brought the ship up the same way from the bridge. So that further uh, pissed off the British as you can imagine. <laughs> okay, so they leave there a couple of days before the, the famous battle. And they get weathered in. It's a tough, tough, uh, tough time of year. It's February, of course, like now. And let me show you what I think really happened. So here's another map of the hills, right? You can see part of Sandy Hook here. That's about where the East of Hartshorn House is. That's Hartshorn's Cove on the Navasink. Okay. So it seemed to me, and, and Mary kept writing about, they landed below Richard Hartshorn's house. Now, below is the operative word. What does that mean? Well, if it means that they land below it over here, they're not going to surprise anybody at that house. Okay? Because they're going to hear them and see them coming, and they're probably going to see the ship if they're in there. And if they land below, meaning the other side, then they would have had to cross Clay Pit Creek. They're going to make a lot of noise. There's 170 some troops. They're not going to surprise anybody. So I pretty quickly ruled out which she said Richard Hartshorn's house on the cove as the site of the battle. But the other side, of course, where uh, Beasick's house was, makes more sense. And that's an actual uniform of what the regiment of foot wear. They were actually, indeed, redcoats. Um, and what we know from, the, from her uh, depiction and others is that they come up through the snow. So I'm almost certainly land there at Rocky Point. All right, and they make their way up this way through the snowy, cold woods in February. And then they do what they call a flanking uh, movement against the house where they know the militia is. And so disaster occurs, okay? Again, we lose, the militia loses 25 members killed, 72 are captured, the vast majority of it, 40 escape. A lot of them are buried up there still, you know, no, nobody will ever know unless they... They dig them. Um, and so, you know, history takes its place. Um, and again, the British threw this whole thing because the surprise itself lost only one man. Now, think about that. It's a February night, okay, and you're, you know, with the militia up here in the hills, and you're probably, you know, hanging out by a fireplace, probably indoors. You know, you have a little guard down, down at the shoreline uh, who does get surprised. And right where we are, roughly coming up here, the 170 British troops try to be as quiet as soldiers can, but they had to be making noise. But it's a cold, probably windy night, and nobody hears them until the guard gets surprised. And then the militia actually flees out of panic. You know, they're probably half asleep as well. Okay. Give due word, uh, credit where it's due. There's a couple of more than a couple. There's at least three Richard Hartorns alive at the time of this battle. And I think that has caused a confusion over the years. There's a quartermaster who I think, I know actually lives there because he's living in his father Robert's house. There's Robert's got a, a, a I'm sorry, that's his, his son right there, Richard. Quartermaster Richard's another branch of the family. And then Isaac up here, he also had a son, Richard, but he's too young to be part of the battle. Um, you know, he's like 11 years old. So it's easy to see where the hearts want to repeat those names, Richard and Robert, all the time, generation and generation, uh, can be confused. So everything was working dandy for a second. Well, when it catches up to me, um, 
when they are taken captive, these prisoners, these POW, are taken to uh, Sandy Hook first, put on a ship, and they're transported up. And uh, uh, Murray Hyde says they go to the Sugar House in New York. And she's right with a couple of provisos here. Sorry, we were doing really well, weren't we? Anyway, long story short, there were four different sugar houses in New York. And they were what they sound like. When sugar was produced mostly in Barbados and the English, but down in the Caribbean, it transported up here, and they were stored and refined in sugar houses. The Livingston's had one, and a couple of other families had one. And so when the British, during the war, occupied New York, they decided that they were going to use these as prisoners. And they're brutal from every report because all of these American prisoners, not just in February of 77, but any time they're captured and brought up to the sugar house, will suffer incredible hardship. A lot of them die, including the men who were taken from this incident, which I promised to show you one of these days. Um, and not only that, you know about the prison ship Jersey? Yeah. Another iron. So there's a place in Brooklyn called Wallabout Bay. Okay, it faces New York Harbor, New York uh, Island, Manhattan. And the British took an old ship called the Jersey, ironically enough, too, and used it because it had outlived its uh, useful life as a prison. And they would put American colonists, rebels, how they want to characterize it, in this prison ship, and they would die in 12, 13 at night because they were. You know, in rags, basically, there was no heat in there. They were given minimum of food. And when they died, they were more or less buried across the street in Brooklyn now. And I was going to show you the memorial there. So if you got captured during the Revolutionary War from this part of our geography, and you were sent to New York, you could have gone to one of the one that you were at, or the prison ship Jersey, and there were a couple of other prison ships too. And there were men that lived there for more than a couple of years. Uh, and a couple of the people in our talks, talk here, which I promised to show you, were actually there uh, and died as a result of the way they were treated. Ah, there it is, finally. Okay, so she says that they're taken to the old sugar house at Nassau and Liberty Street. Okay, and this is a list, a contemporary list of all of the men, they were all men, who were captured during the battle here in February 1777. And there's some really, really prominent Monmouth County names, as you would suspect, on this list. Okay. And when it catches up with me, I'll show you what they are. Okay. First of all, I think she's right. It probably was the Livingston Sugar House uh, up there at kind of the uh, bottom, the East River side of Manhattan, if you would. Um, look at some of these names that you're going to recognize right away. Holmes, Hendrickson, Vanderveer, Hankinson, Burroughs, Smock, Foreman. Okay, so it's a combination, as you would suspect, of both Dutch and English names. These are the people that are on this list, including the one I put in black there, okay, a guy named Thomas Mount, who dies in the Sugar House prison in April, a couple of months after his captive. And right here tonight, we have, where are you? Where are you? Where's Eddie? Okay. Eddie, what is he to you? Thomas Mann. <laughs> Come on, Eddie, I said to so Anyway, he's a descendant of that guy and a whole lot of other things. And so, living among us, living here tonight, and a lot of other places in Monmouth County, are the descendants of some of these guys who did make it back. I live in Farmingdale, and a guy on this list, Joseph Goodenough, when he gets out, his sons create this big community down where I live uh, and settle into that part of, of Monmouth County. Okay, so what we mostly have for those that made it back out of prison after this war are their gravestones. So here's one, James Morris, okay, a militia man. He, he died, he lived through the war, obviously, dies in 1820. We know where he's buried. We have... Uh, Obviously, uh, the location of the stone and a whole lot of other information about it. And that's mostly what we have, except in a couple of incidents. Now, think about it. In 1770, 1780, 1780, whatever it is, you don't have cameras 
And unless you're very wealthy, you're not hiring an artist to sketch you and paint you. And we don't have a lot of images, but we do have a couple of the people that were here. That one on the left is Captain Joseph Stillwell. Which he likes to say looks like George Washington of the now twin brother. <laughs> and with all respect to the Stillwell family, that are still among us, I think he was the inspiration for the Coneheads, but that may be. <laughs> Uh, down in the right is a guy named David, Black David Corbett. The British hated this guy. This was a freehold, and he was one of the leaders. In fact, he's the guy that signed this documentation of the prisoners because he was a brutal guy. So make no mistake about it. War is war. Both sides uh, inflict the brutality on the other. But Black David Corbett was especially noteworthy for that. But we have another image. Which is just a proof of history of somebody that was involved in this battle. That's mm -hmm. Betty Dorn, who was a black enslaved woman at Eastern Court Fort And she was 17 years old when this battle happened, administering, if you will, to the truth cover there. And so of all of these same people. And as unlikely as it might be, we had a video the other day of her and all the ones that changed the manual. Why do you thought that was a famous video? That famous people, and then a lonely and safe person who survived to all the forest. Uh, and we have her image um, that came down, by the way, from the Hartshorn family. And I found it at the Monmouth County Resort Association of Freedom, which is where I got a lot of this information um, because it's a remarkable, remarkable archive of this. So here was what I was going to show you before. Lower Manhattan, you can see there were any number of POW locations. Okay, the provost jail was here, notoriously run by this, I hate to say it, Irishman who was well known for brutalizing POWs. This is Livingston down here, where I think the majority of these folks were brought. Here's an image of a uh, prison ship Jersey in Wallabout Bay on the Brooklyn side. Uh, and if you go there today uh, in Brooklyn, they've got a monument to the thousands of men who were imprisoned there, most of whom died when they were here. The lucky ones, as you know, got back here and had, had, had lives there with that. So when you read about sugar houses or hear about them, you really got to ask yourself, I do anyway, which one? Uh, because there were any number of them, none of which exist anymore. So, finishing up and bringing us up to date. Where was this thing? And where did it happen? So, here's Route 36. Here's Cavoogian Field, where I played you know, baseball when I was a kid with all my friends. And that was disappointing when I found out about this because I got a hold of Rich White, you might know the archaeologist from the university, and I said, hey, I think I know where the battle was. Why don't we do a dig? And he said, oh, great, find out about it. But this hill where Kabuja Field was, was leveled in the floor to make that a baseball softball. So a lot of what had happened here was destroyed. I'll tell you what I mean by that. The British are, if, if they're doing these flanking lines coming toward this house, they're coming up this part, you know, of what becomes Madison Avenue. And anything that they might have done there or any military things that they would have lost or dropped or bodies or anything else were likely destroyed when that part of Highlands was leveled for the fields. And also when these houses were built up here, okay? Uh, and the other way is even more treacherous because you can't tell from this, but it's a hill. So it's almost impossible to do any responsible archeological work there. Um, there's a little image I found from uh, 1947 that says when they're leveling the region field. Okay, here's another image. There's water which you have today, right? Half a mile or so from here. There's Linden. Here is where the Eastern uh, East, Essex, sorry, Hartshorn House is between Rogers and Waddell Avenue. What is now Shore Drive was the old train tracks. And right about here, not Honey Park, but right there is about where Joshua Honey was hanged when that was on the shoreline. Because roughly from shore uh, drive 
to here the walls of the building, much later in time. So I went down there and I took some pictures and I was trying to convince Rich that we should do a dig, except that there's nothing to see anymore. Okay, uh, a little bit out of focus, but this hillside here, you know, is overgrown with private property anyway. Uh, and what are the likelihood of finding anything 100 and, uh, you know, 247 years later? Um, where the house was, the boarding house, the Navasink Hotel, all of this stuff was right there, which is now some kind of condominium complex. And oh, by the way, Waddell was named after Colonel Jones' son-in-law, Waddell, and Rogers, I believe, was one of his business associates. So all of that tied together for me when I was trying to convince myself this was the location. Um, and I don't know what those scratches are, but here's my question for all of you. Why wasn't this battle talked about, remembered? Good what? That's a real good reason. Anybody else? Who's writing the history that we all read going to grammar school? Well, our side, right? That's why I, I go back to the Patriot and Rebel. It depends on which side you're fighting on. We're all taught as kids that, you know, the Patriot side, the Sound of Arp, and the Ringing side. And so we're going to talk about things that are a little bit more um, spectacular, like the Bottom of Palamama, which is actually a tie, but it changed the course of the war in real time with the up of the victory. This was a disaster. Uh, and it was also very early. Remember, the war really kicks off in, you know, around 1776. We declare our independence in July. This is only a few months later. Okay, and things have been kind of warming up to the atrocities that we went on. Just so, a few weeks after the Prince of Trent, which were wonderful psychological. So there's all kinds of reasons this got forgotten, but I think the first thing is exactly right. It's an embarrassing defeat. We don't want to think of our forebearers, whoever they might have been, as you know, basically turning tail and running on the first period of British fleet. Uh, uh, so that's why it's up with it. Anybody else have any ideas of why it might have been sort of written out of history except locally? It's waiting for the cookie, don't <laughs> So let me let me say this in all sincerity. These are my investigations, and this is what I believe to be true. But if you see <clears throat> holes in this, I want to know them. Okay, because I put together as close as I can get the primary sources, and then, you know, as we saw a trail of the history, we try to figure out where it happened, what is likely to have happened, and the results. Um, but you no know, more than any other person does this, I, I can't get everything. So if I miss something, I want to know more. Uh, uh, question. Um, the Pincher movement, as the, the uh, Red Coats were closing in on power, the ones that were to the south that came down by Ballfield, um, what, what was on that side? What was to the south? Hills and, hills and woods. Yeah. And all woods. Navasin, I'm pretty Navasin. sure Navasin. There might have been a dirt road, but it certainly wasn't anything. Uh, so they were actually going to the woods. Yeah. All of the reports that you read, including Mary. Uh, uh, very high is that they're marching through the woods. And that was part of the part of the, uh, the idea, right? They're trying to surprise this militia. They had no idea what they're going to face before they get there. And the militia was going to look like to fight a pretty seedy British force, who was Scottish, by the way, uh, and had been trained very directly by the British. So it's a good question. So, and, you know, when they surprise the guard, the guard runs away, the militia. I'm sure they're waking up saying, what's going on? They've got to be fired and they're going, we're out of here. And the unlucky ones get caught. Anybody else? Yes, sir. You're saying they landed at what point and they went up the hill? That's incredible. Well, I think what they did was, you know, Rocky Point was there. I think they came along towards it, could along what, whatever the shoreline was, and then go through the hill. Even today, um, at road, it's, it's a real slow yeah, yeah. You don't want to walk through the hills on here. Right. Okay, I will repeat the question. Who else had a question? Yes, they had a question. Did you ever run that list of captured militiamen as a contingent of militia? Because in 1777, they were newly born, and I imagine that 82 of them, or however that were on that list, were whisked off to the sugar house. Plus 25, which this lady said, 
that's the whole French president. Russia. So that to me seems a little high. Brazier says in his book that the reason he's on all these stuff, the case of the Jersey Geological Society magazine, that three were hit there of 25. Um, I don't know how to reconcile this. If it, if it was only three or if it was 25, but with the grandfather, thought was good. And he has a pension, which lists him. There's also, I think, Thomas Whitlock and Nick Crawford. I couldn't read the name for the difficulty reading the, the record. So, what she's asking for the rumors is uh, about the, and I followed up, I think it's going to be the sum. But somebody way back there in our last row has been doing really great work. Okay, Michelle is part of the DAR, and they have a project where they're identifying. And so, and so is Molly. Oh, sorry, of course. <laughs> so, sorry. That's okay. Uh, but the point is, I've looked at the list of 72, and I, I forget now what's coming in. I can identify about 30 of them because they show up in other documentation. Uh, those of you who aren't researching, there's a great thing that we all use called Fold Free, which are military records all the way back in time here. And it lists pension applications and all kinds of things, sometimes service records of a lot of these people. Uh, and I knew Ed Razor very well. He knew and did a tremendous service in a lot of county history. In fact, his family goes way back to Penelope South. That's how long ago with his family was. Uh, and I don't know where he, I never talked about this. I don't know where he got that number three, but it was substantially more. Because you're right, it wiped out most of that prior prior yes. militia. How long will it take them to regroup? Because they, they That's a great question. How, do, how, do, how long does it take to regroup a militia? So first of all, who are militia? So you and I may, may grow up thinking, oh, of course, I live in Monmouth County, the damn British government. They're giving, us a, they're giving us a hard time and we're going to sign up. No, no, it didn't happen that way. Okay. The average person that you and I may be, I hope, uh, are worried about, you know, uh, home and heart and our little farm if we were lucky enough to have one and our family and how are we going to survive all this stuff going back and forth. And it's not like a lot of men running out the door saying, sign me up. I want to shoot them down. Okay. They didn't quite get drafted, but in some cases they were forced into service, and it was um, kind of a piecemeal effort. So when you lose a bunch like this, all in one fell swoop, if you're sitting back and you're a you know, 20, 30, 40 year old man here, and you heard what just happened, I don't know how anxious you're going to be to sign up for the militia. Yeah. <laughs> you might be. I'm well, not saying there wasn't hatred. And you might have had a relative that was abused by the British, and you might be really mad about it and sign up right away. But I think it took a while. I don't know the number of months or years, but it took a while to rebuild. And they were constantly rebuilding that because they're constantly losing and fighting and switching sides. You know, there's little stories, a lot of stories about men who start out as working on the rebel side and then look around and go, oh, maybe I made a mistake. Let me go with the Brits. <laughs> that looks like the wings. Didn't three weeks later they attacked Sandy Hook? So that's an interesting story too, because Sandy Hook now is this fortification around the lighthouse, becomes later known as refugee towns. Rich White did a, a dig there a couple summers ago, where the refugees, British loyalists, who can't live here among us because they're on the outside looking in. They go over to Sandy Hook. They're guarding the lighthouse. They set up a little bit of fortifications. That's where Colonel Pyler comes from. And so they get attacked, and we, meaning the Patriot rebel side, however, attack and fire at the lighthouse. And allegedly, you can still see where the cannonballs bounced off that lighthouse. Because although we tried several times during the war to retake Sandy Hook, we never did successfully. I mean, the British, you know, they're pretty smart, and they've got seasoned troops not just Tory uh, refugees there. Um, so the more you read about regulatory war history, it's very, very complicated and very interesting because of all these forces go back. Read Michael Adelberg's books, okay? Tremendous research that he did when he lived here uh, about the, uh, as he called the Civil War in Mama Caps and how people switch sides and, you know, we're selling one day to the British because they had a bunch of farm goods 
and the next day they're selling to the military. It's survival, which people do in any war that I know about. In fact, Mike Albert calls them trimmers. They trim their sails depending upon which way the wind blows. Great, great description, right? If it looks like the British are to call on, on their best friends, otherwise they're going the other way. This isn't a question exactly, but a comment referred to the monument to the British the prison ship martyrs. I just wanted folks to know if they're ever in the city downtown Brooklyn, Fort Green Park is where the monument is, very near the wall of And I think when they're fleeing, I think it's trying to get to the hearts on the folk, the other side, mm -hmm. uh, which would be they would uh, be safer there and maybe get across the river to the Black Point. Or, or, so all these little intricacies and pits that are fascinating, you know, the data and all that, they also can do such a good job. But you find out these are not just names, numbers, or super size. These are real life people who had lives sometimes after the revolution who recorded those. Lives, uh, and we're finding out more and more all the time. So we live in an incredibly, incredibly historic part of the world. You know, who cares about California right now? So we have all this stuff here. Uh, and not to forget again, that for thousands of years before we ever got here, another group of people. Topic for no time, but let me just disabuse us all of a note. A lot of us grew up being told that the Indians were not the people. Well, commuters of the summer. They came mm -hmm. down here and enjoyed the shore like we did. I first off was here, we didn't have all that. But that's not true. Okay. There's a really, really amazing scholar who's gone now who did a lot of work. And it turns out because of the rich resources in this part of our county, these people live here all year round. Why would they go back and forth? You had abundant fish and shellfish, and they were growing stuff and everything else. So the Muncie Lenape people were here all year round. So we brought them disease, and then they were wild. It was 100 years, not even so much ago. So let's not forget that there were people here before, before European uh, folks got here. So who else got a uh, yes, sir? Uh, a gentleman, I believe, before. Go ahead. Okay, uh, this is purely a speculation on my part, but it might address some of the uh, reconcile the Richard Hartshorn as a Hartshorn house. Is, was there a path between Richard Hartshorn's house and is it? Not that I know, because it's over the hill. Right. So you know, in those days, if you're if you're in the cold, you're just going to get in a little boat and come around. If you're going to visit your brother or your relative, there might have been a rudimentary path or something, but it doesn't show up in the early maps. So yeah, the answer is yes and no. Um, they, yeah, I suspect it's easier to come the other way. Anybody walk through Hearts Run Foot? Yeah, it's, it's incredible. Yeah. But you and I don't say on the path, yeah. By the wood on it. In fact, here, here's my town on the way home tonight. <laughs> 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 Everybody needs to see there, but uh, Herb lived up there, he, he knows exactly what that, that part of the world was like. And it's developed now, but there's still a big expanse of wood. The battle was running now. So as the patriarch became retreating, they were being chased, and the fight continued to die in that way. So it was it? I think the majority, again, reading between the lines, I think the majority of them were killed when they were surprised. And the ones that ran away, some were shot, some were even wounded and died later. 
I don't think they put up much of resistance. There's nothing about this. That's why I said, is it a battle or a skirmish? There's not this fixed fighting where they're all you know, behind 